Erica, and I will be ministering today's announcements. And I see a lot of new, beautiful, and handsome faces in the crowd, so I want to take this time to welcome all of our new visitors. Could you please stand? Any first-time visitors today? Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, moving on. I would like to welcome our volunteer crew from Eagle Mountain International Church. Could you please stand? Holly? Yay. We really appreciate all of your hard work. They're joining us throughout the week to the Broad Channel in Far Rockaway. And we will be rebuilding homes for the families we adopted and visiting people door to door. So we really appreciate them. Thank you so much for joining us and helping out. So it's su such an awesome thing that you're doing. And I know God's going to bless you. Also, I wanted to review our service times. Sunday, we have interse um, intercessory prayer at 10 a.m. And we have worship in the word at 10.30 a.m. Wednesday, we have 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. noon hour prayer, and you can come as long as you like, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or the entire hour, and on Wednesday evening, we have our 7.30 p.m. service. Also, I didn't mention this, but I don't know, if you haven't been to this church before, I'll just say it again. You may have heard that New York City is the city of sin, but I'm here to tell you that this is Christ Town. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The city of righteousness, home of the burden-removing, yoke-destroying people of Yahweh. I am that I am. We are friends of the Holy Spirit, carriers of his contagious anointing power. This is the safest and healthiest city in the world. And we would like to welcome you to Christ Town. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. And... I was going to skip past that, but I had to remind myself that because um, I just had an incident actually earlier this week. Um, I work in an area that there's a lot of violence, and, you know, I had to really remind myself that we're, we're covered in the blood of Jesus. And what Satan meant to harm me, to steal, to rob me, God turned it around for good. So we're, we're covered in the blood of Jesus. We're, we don't walk in fear. Because perfect love casts away all of our fears. So I just wanted to remind you, even though the news says that this city is horrible, it's violent, and I have to remind myself too when I'm walking around to not expect bad to happen. We are the solution to the problem. So I just wanted to remind all of us that, including myself. Also, Tuesday, April 30th is the next Deeper Life conference call, so make sure you're on the call. And Friday, May 17th through Sunday, May 19th, is our Deeper Life Conference. And we'll be celebrating the Festival of Weeks with Pastor Dan and Taraka Patterson. Also joining us are Janan Glasskow, Kyle Newton, Elson Bennett, David Gonzalez, Tom Waltz, and praise singer Callie Bennett. So please, if you can come, you will be blessed and try to make it out. And Sunday, June 2nd, Pastor Annie will be having her miracle healing service. Bring all that need healing in their body, mind, and spirit. Please bring them. They will get healed because the word always works. And <clears throat> Sunday, June 9th, we're going to have a party to celebrate all of the volunteers at Faith Exchange. If you are not sewing time yet, now is the time to join one of our departments. Relief efforts, cleaning, cooking, children's church, usher, greeter, etc. Anything that you can do to use your talents, we need you. Um, it could be pastor's committee, praise and worship, office help. Please see Errol Footman, who's in the back. He's raising his hand to find out which you can be of service. And Tuesday, July 30th, Jesse Duplantis will be at Faith Exchange. Yeah. So if you come, you will definitely be in for a treat. He's awesome. I came last year, and I was really blessed. So I'm going to stop talking now and pass the mic to our lovely and beautiful anointed Rachel Lewinson, who's going to minister the word tonight. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to say, Erica, it's so nice to have you here with us. Last time I preached, you were still in Virginia, so I'm really happy to have you here in New York. Uh, so happy May, everyone. It's May 1st. 
so the, we missed the deeper life call that was on the 30th there. <laughs> um, and I just want to greet myself. I greet everybody from Texas. It's great to have you here. Thank you for coming. And thank you for sitting in the front. It's great to have a full house on a Wednesday night. Um, I'm really happy to be here on a Wednesday night. Hi, everyone online. Just letting you know the days are getting longer, the weather is getting nicer. So if you live close, come out and see us in person. I'm definitely hoping to do that more now that the weather's getting warmer. Um, and uh, since it's May 1st, we, are, um, we have a Deeper Life program here at the church, and so we have new books that we're reading for the month of May. Does anybody want to share what those are? Anybody know? The, the books for May. <laughs> Luke, Galatians, Ephesians, what was that? Nahum, Micah, Jonah, and First and Second Chronicles. So, um, you know, we try and read in rhythm every every month, read the same books so that we're uh, in rhythm with our conversations. So, um, I'm going to be focusing mostly in Luke tonight, um, with some Proverbs as well. Uh, and first, I just want to open with prayer. Um, Abba Yahweh, I just thank you and praise you for everybody that's here tonight, everybody on their way everybody online, everybody who will hear the recording. I just thank you for them. I pray that you give me the perfect words to say to them. I just make myself fully available to you. Just have your way in me. And I thank you that your will be done in their lives. I just also plead the bloody Yeshua over all of our equipment, our sound equipment, the internet broadcast. I thank you that there will be no interruptions, no distractions in Yeshua, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, just, I don't know how much you Texas folks know about, but we, um, we use the names Yahweh and Yeshua more than uh, Lord, God, and Jesus. We just um, focus on the Hebrew pronunciation, the Hebrew um, roots of those names. So that's what we're saying. Um, and I just want to share um, some of my, I'm going to be sharing my testimony throughout um, as I preach tonight. Um, for those who don't know, I'm uh, married, I have four children, I've been coming to this church since 2000, and I met my husband here, so we are very blessed to be part of this family. Um, and just last year, it's been a year and a month now that I quit my full-time job to be home with my kids, so that was a uh, you know, seven-year testimony in the making. <laughs> Um, so my kids are, are seven, six, three, and four months now. Um, so yeah, it's just a blessing to be home with them. Um, I now realize, you know, he wasn't just letting me be, come home to be a stay-at-home mom, but he was really calling me home to educate and train them. Um, and I'm seeing that play out more and more. That's, that's unfolding um, more and more now. And... Um, so last year was my year of living fearlessly. Part of that was quitting my job. Um, and so I you know, took all these risks and I really made an effort to live fearlessly. So I took a lot of uh, actions that would be f considered fearless, but I still had a hard time kind of you know, feeling fearless. Um, and so I didn't necessarily enjoy every moment of it as much as I could have. So for this year, I made the adjustment, this is my year of being doubtless. So I'm really trying to, you know, <laughs> enjoy not just victory, but sweatless victory. Just, you know, not giving in to anxiety and fear as I continue to, to walk this out. And I think I'm actually making some progress, so <laughs> I'm starting to have some fun, so it's good. Um, and so I wanted to share... Um, Let's see here. Um, so we focus a lot here on being like Yeshua. Um, and, you know, I, I wanted to share that, you know, as I'm walking out this calling that I have, I'm seeing Yeshua manifest more and more in me and in different ways. Like I'm able to see more ways that, that he comes out of me. And, um, you know, when we first... Uh, started our, well, we've had the Deeper Life program for quite a long time, but it's gone through different iterations. And so, um, you know, maybe about a year or so ago, I guess, we focused more on the service aspect, really serving three people, giving your life to three people. And so, you know, when we first did it, um, 
I started to struggle with it because, you know, I felt like as a busy mom, you know, how can I train three adults so like in addition to my kids? I was kind of like, you know, my three are my kids, you know, you know otherwise I'll, I'll do the best I can. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I really, I've been grappling with it, you know, and so uh, over time I've seen that um, the importance of the red letters, that's another thing that we focus on here is, you know, we read the whole word, we love the whole word, but we focus heavily on the red letters, the words that Yeshua spoke specifically because, um, you know, it's not so much about, you know, what kind of clothes Jesus wore and what cities he went to and specifically who he was talking to. It's more, you know, what were the words that he gave voice to? You know, what, what came out of the abundance of his heart? You know, what did he think important to say and to really get to the spirit of him? Because, um, you know, as much as I didn't realize it, I was focused more on, okay, he's a single man and I'm a married woman with four children, how can I do what he did, you know? How can I take these people traipsing all over <laughs> and preaching and healing people, you know? Like, I need to, I have my children, I need to be home with them, and um, I just, I guess I had a kind of a fear of, you know, not being able to balance that. So, um, the more I focus on the red letters, the more I can see how, you know, the spirit of Yeshua can manifest in me. So tonight's message is titled, Looking for Love in the One Right Place. Um, uh, so uh, that came from, we went to a funeral, uh, my husband and I, two Saturdays ago. His grandfather um, passed away, or I like to use the euphemism, he retired his earth jersey. <laughs> um, <laughs> I prefer that to, like everybody says, he went home to be with the Lord because really we're trying to be home with the Lord right now in this life. We don't need to wait for that to happen. So we really want to strive to be home with him right now. So um, I also want to point out I'm a woman using a sports metaphor. It does happen. <laughs> Some of us really enjoy sports metaphors, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> So uh, we went to this funeral, and this is his father's father, and um, his parents were never married, and his father hasn't really been there for him most of his life. But his uh, grandfather, especially in his early life, was the one person on that side of the family that was, that was there and really um, kind of took him under his wing and helped him out. So we wanted to go honor him, and uh, we knew at the same time that Orville's dad was going to be there along with his wife and two children that I had never met. Orville had only met them once, you know, when he was a kid. So, um, you know, we were believing for just major relationship breakthrough. We were thinking, okay, let's believe Yahweh that we're going to really uh, get to know these people, get to love them, and, you know, put all the past behind them, behind us. Um, and um, just needless to say, that didn't happen. So... Um, it was just interesting to go through. Um, you know, it was especially the main reaction that I had was just shock that, you know, people can actually really hold on to like decades of bitterness over something that, you know, in a lot of cases it's not even that important. Um, and even when someone has passed away, they still don't want to let it go. Like that just shocked me. And, and it was really like a a wake-up call like, wow, I'm so blessed that I don't struggle with that, you know, and I hardly know anybody who struggles with that. And that's not to judge them, but it's just, you know, um, I just really wasn't expecting that. So um, as we're driving home, I'm like just trying to like process what, what happened. And, and nobody was like really rude to us. It was just kind of like, you know, keep your distance kind of thing, you know. Hi, how are you? Nice to meet you. And, and then otherwise... <laughs> stay on the other side of the room. Um, so, uh, you know, sometimes he always speaks to me with songs, and so a lot of times it's like comic relief. When something's really tense, he'll get me to laugh about it. So then I heard in my head on the way home, looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of like the backdrop as I've been, you know, hearing the word for the last couple of weeks. Um, and... 
So we're focusing on looking for love in the one right place. So, you know, everywhere you look, um, you should be looking for love. Love is a person, and he is omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, which means he's all-knowing, he's um, invincible, and he's always accessible. So, you know, why would you ever go anywhere not looking for him or without him? Why would you not ever um, want to invite him into every situation? Um, love is all around us. Um, we used to sing a song um, a lot here, uh, All Around, by Israel Houghton. And I still sing that at home with the kids a lot, because um, we do praise and worship in the mornings. And, uh, you know, it's basically, everywhere I look, your love is all around. That's basically the, the whole song. Um, and it's funny for me, because, like, I can literally see it as my kids are running around me <laughs> while they're singing it, love is all around. And all day long, love is all around. Um, so. It's really nice for me, you know, now that I'm home, to really be able to see that tangible, of, you know, a reminder all the time that I'm bearing fruit. And that's one thing that I, that I want to say about love is that it's always bearing fruit. You know, when I go places now, um, usually I, I'm with the whole family. And so, you know, wherever we go, people um, have a pretty strong reaction to us. You know, I see the hallelujah, you have four children, that's wonderful, and, you know, complimenting and everything, which is great, that's the reaction I prefer. And then there's the, oh my God, you have four kids, are you crazy? Like, you know, they just can't, <laughs> can't fathom why someone would do that. <laughs> um, but it's cool because, you know, my fruit is right there with me, and, uh, you know, it's like I don't really have to say much, and, and I felt like that was the case at the funeral. You know, even though we didn't necessarily get to talk to everybody a lot in depth, they could just see, you know, the fruit in our lives. And hopefully, you know, that ministered to them. And even, again, if you're not uh, a parent, um, it, you know, you can still have that same effect because, you know, your friends should be around you. The, the fruit that you're bearing in your life should be evident everywhere you go. When you think, again, of Yeshua, um, you know, he practically had to, like, beat people away with a stick just to go get alone and pray, you know. And really, that's how we should be. We should have people flocking to us um, because of the love that's flowing out of us. Okay. So Yeshua is love made visible. Um, he was in Yahweh before time began. And once our eyes are opened... We should see him and only him everywhere that we go. And then in turn, we should point him out to others, help others to see him everywhere they, that they go. Um, so these days, you know, pretty much any conversation you get into, it's not long before people start speaking about fear and the latest tragedy and, you know, things like that. So when you hear that, you know, you, you always have an opportunity to you know, help them to see Yeshua, help them to see victory, salvation, deliverance. That's what the name Yeshua means, to see that in every situation. Um, the scriptures portray him from Genesis to Revelation. He's in you and me. He's our past, our present, and our future. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Um, so Pastor Dan lately has been talking about uh, not looking back. Um, and a lot of times... Like, I get revelations when something initially doesn't make sense to me. You know, like, uh, I'll have to grapple with something. So this was another thing when he said, you know, you never look back. I was kind of like, well, I mean, when you think about it, reading the scripture is looking back. Because you're looking, you know, you're reading about these people who lived a long time ago. And you're learning from them. Um, and, of course, applying it today. But... Um, you know, when, you, when you're talking about looking back, looking forward, really that's just um, relative terms for us here on earth because Yahweh, Yeshua, is outside of time. He's timeless. So, you know, to us it's looking back. But really, as long as you're looking for Yeshua, no matter where you're looking, you're always looking forward. He's the definition of forward. Um, he's the definition of progress, productivity. You know, he's outside of time. So um, as long as you, you know, you can't, he can't be confined by time, as long as you're looking, you know, the point is that you don't want to look back to, uh, 
you know, make excuses or blame anybody or even to rest on your laurels. Um, you know, it's not about getting stuck in a certain place or even about closure. You know, you're always looking for what you can do right now and forward, how you can go forward with it. So, um, you know, he, as long as you're looking for him, he's always right now and forward. And he's in eternity. We're in eternity right now. Um, we're in it now and we'll always be in it. I just turned uh, 39 in April. So I appreciate more than ever Pastor Dan's phrase, if you live forever, when is the midlife crisis? <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I've been hearing that for years, so really I don't, I don't feel at all like I'm near a, a midlife crisis, but um, it's funny because he was about, probably about that age when he started saying it. <laughs> So I can appreciate that. <laughs> um, so I want to go first to Proverbs 1. And uh, that's another thing we do in the deeper life. We read a proverb a day. We just, so on the first, we read the first proverb. Um, and I start in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. To know wisdom and instruction. To know wisdom is to be intimate with wisdom. Um, so Solomon, we know, was one of the wisest men who ever lived, and uh, he knew wisdom. He was intimate with wisdom and instruction. He's telling us, even in that first line, that um, we need to, you know, as we're pursuing love, we need to know wisdom, be intimate with is wisdom and instruction. We're always looking for wisdom and instruction because uh, wisdom and love go hand in hand. I think in Psalms it says that wisdom was with. Yahweh when he created the heavens and the earth. Um, so, you know, in order to, to use love, you need wisdom and instruction. Um, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance, to understand a proverb and a saying the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. So over and over again he's saying knowledge, understanding, wisdom, these are, are things that you're constantly going to be pursuing whether you're uh, you know, very young, naive, or whether you're experienced, you know, already have a lot of wisdom. You're still always going to be pursuing more knowledge, more wisdom, more understanding. Um, and, uh, and when he says the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge, you know, he's saying right there, if you don't first acknowledge Yahweh for who he is, if you don't have a healthy respect for who he is, you can't even have any knowledge. You know, you might think that you know things, but you don't actually know anything worth knowing until you're reverencing him. Um, so as I've been educating my kids, I, I homeschool them. I started homeschooling them in August. Um, so that's part of why I was saying I'm, I'm, I was called home to educate them. I've been learning a ton, and I've been really drawn to the classical model of education, um, which uses something that's called the trivium, and it's scriptural. Um, they, you know, they break down learning into three stages: the grammar stage, which corresponds to knowledge, and that's when you're putting in lots of facts, and uh, you know, it's all about memorizing and and they parrot what you say, and it's not, you know, you're not really concerned about understanding it. It's just put, it, put as much good stuff in as you can. Then comes logic, um, which is understanding. When you understand the why, you start to make connections between things. And then rhetoric, which is wisdom, which is when you can apply it easily in your life and teach others to do the same. Um, so if you're thinking of it like with a computer, you're inputting the information, it's processing, and then, and then the outputs. Um, and you can also look at it as seed time and harvest. You put in the seed, seed in the ground. Time is when you know, the connections are being made, the infrastructure is being put in place, and then the harvest is uh, the fruit, the output. Um, and then along with this, you know, Christian, Christian classical education, you're pursuing truth, love, and beauty at the same time. So you're always putting, 
you know, the best quality stuff in and you put as much of it in as you can. And again, don't worry about the understanding because that comes later. Um, so, I mean, I love it because, you know, it's looking for love and it's pretty much timeless. I mean, people have been doing it for centuries and no matter what kind of new and innovative thing you try to do, you can't really take away from that. You know, it's an ongoing process. Um, and I had this book. Um, it's just cool. As I'm pursuing this stuff, um, you know, I'm just able to see the word in everything that I study, everything I, that I look, look up. So um, I was looking at starting an actual school eventually, um, you know, after it's kind of a, a model that combines homeschooling and you probably know about it, university model, model schools, they're in Texas and I went there to, to, to learn about it. Um, so I just got this book in the mail, one of the companies sent it to me, and this is pretty much like our deeper life program in this book, like to a T, it's amazing, because you know, I set out saying I wanted to make our deeper life program applicable for our kids from the youngest ages and be able to you know, basically turn it into a curriculum, um, not a curriculum, but you know, just a way of educating. So. You know, this comes in the mail, and I'm like, are you serious? Like, it even has the greenhouse, like, everything. Um, and I'm just amazed because, you know, uh, I don't have to do it in my own strength. You know, Yahweh is just bringing, bringing this stuff to me and showing me how, you know, it'll play out um, over time. So one of the things that they said, uh, this came with a CD, and they were talking about the word for wor worship and the word for work is the same word in Hebrew. It's avodah. And um, they actually did, uh, they've done a lot of brain studies where um, it shows that when a person is working hard, when they're challenging themselves, all the blood flows to a certain area in the brain that produces pleasure. Um, and the same thing happens when somebody's worshiping, goes to that same spot and, and produces pleasure. Um, and so they were kind of lamenting the fact that today's education style with all the multimedia and, and video games is actually changing the way the brain functions and causing all the blood to, to flood um, to the pleasure area from these images coming at them. And so they're getting the sensation that they're working and worshiping when they're actually just very passive sitting there. Um, so, you know, they're calling, calling to go back to um, this kind of discipleship model because, again, like this is a timeless thing, you can't get around it. The, the way to short circuit or fix that problem, the only way to, to get through to the youth, um, you know, who are inundated with this kind of stuff is one-on-one -on -one conversation, one-on-one -on -one personal mentoring because that, you know, that kind of conversation, that drawing them, drawing them out, um, you know, overrides the, the malfunctioning of the, or whatever you call it, the, you know, the change in function of the brain. Um, so I just thought that was pretty amazing. Um, I wanted to share. <laughs> so we need to go back to the fundamentals. Uh, I want to go to Luke 4 and read some red letters. Um, Luke 4, verse 18. I'm sure everybody knows this one. The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor. Today this scripture has been fulfilled in your ears. So what would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? That's another question that we um, are always asking around here. What would I do if I knew I couldn't fail? And the answer is, be like Yeshua. The answer always for everyone is, be like Yeshua. But what does Yeshua look like in my life and in my time? You have to ask yourself that. Um, so, you know, I did that. I've been doing that, like I was describing, tr grappling with being like Yeshua and being able to disciple. So I can say honestly that I am proclaiming the good news to the poor by my example. You know, even if you don't have a bunch of money in the bank, 
even if you don't own your own house yet at 39 years old or have you know all the things that you think you should have by a certain age you can still be exactly who Yahweh called you to be you can still move forward with what you have and with what you know and just put a demand on him to supply what you need you know where you are weak he is strong so there's no, you know, nothing to wait for. You just go and expect him to show up. Amen. Amen. Um, and you don't have to sprint. You know, it's not like you're too late. You're never too late. If you're in him, you're always on time. So as long as you keep moving forward, not backwards, keep moving forward, whether it's inch by inch, foot by foot. You know, we have different seasons, but as long as you're moving forward, um, you know, you're going to, to get there. And then he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives. So I can see that in, um, when I'm looking at the education system. He has sent me to help families, parents and children who know that this current system is not working for them. They see, you know, they're miserable, they don't like it. I can say to them, you don't have to go along with it, you know. I can encourage them, you know, I, I didn't think I could do it either, but I'm doing it. And, you know, we can come out of this. We can, you know, say no to the materialism and the different things that, that are making you think you have to stay in this particular um, life and in this particular way of doing things. You don't have to, to go along with it. So what would you do if you knew you couldn't fail? You know, what is it that would free you from this? What, what is it that would you would feel would be worthwhile to pursue to pull you out of this. Um, and then he has sent me to recover sight to the blind. So again, using the classical education model, um, they focus a lot on, you know, um, reminding people that, you know, most of the great uh, thinkers, great inventors, in different, you know, in science and math, different things, um, knew the word and they, they were looking for Yahweh in everything that they did. They were pursuing him um, and they encouraged going back to the original sources for things and, uh, you know, realizing that throughout history, you know, throughout time, people, um, in many cases, they knew that, you know, Yahweh was true and every man is a liar. They knew that their opinion wasn't that important that there was a truth, you know, and that they had to search out that truth um, rather than make it up, you know. So it's reminding people of that. Um, it's the idea of slowing down to speed up. Um, you know, we can find him in everything. If we just look, he will show us witty inventions, life-saving technologies, world-changing solutions to problems. Um, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So in most cases, um, for most of us, our flesh man has been oppressing our spirit man. So it's just, you know, waking people up to that fact. You're a spirit. You know, you're, you're not your flesh. And your spirit can, uh, your spirit is one with God. Your spirit is holy. And your spirit, um, you know, really knows what's best for you. So, you know, let, exercise that spirit. Let it, you know, overrule the flesh um, and it does that benevolently you know it doesn't oppress your flesh but it instructs and trains your flesh um, Proverbs 29 says that when the righteous increase the people rejoice but when the wicked rule the people groan so that's not only outwardly in the world but that's also in you um, so you know your best self let your best self come out and I proclaim that this is the year that it's happening. This is the year that you have Yahweh's favor, that you'll be able to pursue that thing um, that you want to do, that, that you will do if, if you knew you wouldn't fail. And every resource that you need will come to you. The, the connections, the money, the uh, energy, the health, everything that you need will come now. So now faith is. <coughs> Seize the opportunity right now and just keep going. Don't stop. Um, so now you can apply this for yourself, you know, ask yourself these same questions in your life with who you are. How are you going to preach the good news to the poor? How are you going to set the captives free? How are you going to recover the sight to the blind? How are you going to proclaim the year of Yahweh's favor? 
So you should uh, take some time to really ask yourself those questions. Um, I also wanted to make a point that love starts in one place. It comes from one source, and it, you know, it can go. It goes everywhere. That's different from love being in multiple sources that all go back to the same place. So just a little a theological point there. But um, you know, you can't. You can have love everywhere, but you can't get love everywhere. So um, the very next thing that Yeshua says as you do this, um, he says, truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. So again, going back to the funeral example, um, even though you know, our love could have been very apparent um, to just the average person, but you know, because of Orville's position in the family and the stuff that has happened, you know, maybe that's why they weren't able to receive it. Um, but even in that, you know, some people were, I mean, Orville's mother was there and she's awesome. She's always got her gifts stirred up and she's always looking to stir up other people's gifts. So, you know, we connected with her. We had a great time with her and with another uncle of his that, you know, has also kind of been shunned in a way. Um, he too knows Yahweh and we were able to encourage him. So, you know, we were, we were able to, uh, manifest our love and share our love, but it, you know, it just, not everybody got to participate in that. Um, so Yeshua goes on to say, in truth I tell you there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heavens were shut up three years and six months and a great famine came over all the land and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha and none of them was cleansed, but only Naaman the Syrian. So um, we just read Second Kings with Naaman the Syrian. He had leprosy, and he heard that Elisha could heal him. So he traveled from his land. He got a letter from his king to the king of Israel, asking Elisha to heal him. And he came uh, to Israel, and Elisha said, go dip in the Jordan seven times. And Naaman at first was furious because he, you know, was like, that's crazy, that doesn't make any sense. My rivers are better than your rivers, why did I come all the way here? Um, and he was almost going to miss it, but, you know, somebody traveling with him said, well, what do you have to lose? Just dip in the river. So he did, and he got healed, and uh, it was a major, major breakthrough. So um, the point that I wanted to make there is that you know, we're working on the fact that we're a reflection of Yahweh. A son of Yahweh, there's two kinds of sons. There's offspring and there's an, a reflection. So Yeshua, when he said, um, I only do what I see the Father do, I only say what I hear the Father say, he was, he was saying that he's a reflection. He's a visible reflection of Yahweh. And we too need to be that way. So a lot of times when we get something um, for somebody else, we might be tempted to um, try to figure it out, understand it first. Like, if it sounds crazy, we might not want to give that instruction. But we're seeing here that you need to do it. And it's just like the, the first stage of education, the, the grammar, the parrot, you know, you don't think about it, you don't try to understand it, you just repeat it. And then the understanding comes after that. Um, so that's how we need to, to do it. You know, as soon as we, we see something or hear something from Yahweh, act on it before you can think about it. Amen. Okay, and you have to be willing to stand alone. You have to lay down your life. A lot of, um, I think this, for these, these days, laying down your life mainly means lay, laying down your reputation, your social life. Because I think a lot of people, you know, would rather take a bullet and die a hero than, than lose all their friends. Um, so, you know, you will, I mean, you will, you will have great partners and friends to do what you're called to do, but you're not trying to win friends and influence people. You're not looking for man's definition of love, which is here today and gone tomorrow. You're pursuing Yahweh and allowing him to draw people to you. You know, it's not in your strength. And again, I had another, uh, just a recent epiphany about that too, because I was trying to even though it was my first year about to homeschool last year in August, I was trying to simultaneously put together a homeschool co-op, not knowing a thing, of, you know. 
and uh, working with some other families here and you know as I was trying to organize it um, it just wasn't coming together you know and I just didn't know how to make it come together um, and as the date came closer to actually doing it I just started to dread it um, and I you know I just felt like nobody really wanted to do it you know and sometimes in that kind of a situation you need to forge ahead but in this case I knew it would not be a good idea you know it's kind of like trying to share trying to witness Yeshua when you don't really have him you know you really need to have Yeshua for your for your witness to affect somebody so I needed to know what I was doing before I'm trying to you know say follow me <laughs> let's do this together um, and I, I realized I really needed that that year of homeschooling pretty much alone just me and Yahweh just hearing from him what do you want me to do with these kids you know how do I do this and not really get much input from from others sorry microphone um, just to you know so that once I once I had that answer then it's like I know what I'm looking for when I want to connect with somebody I know I'm going to recognize the love in somebody else so that you know we can we can work together on something rather than letting somebody else's idea influence me and pull me off of what what Yahweh wanted um, and so now you know I wasn't even thinking about a co-op this year and because I've been communicating about what's going on um, one of my friends said hey this group sounds like exactly what you want to do have you heard, heard, heard of them and I said no and they, yes they do sound exactly like what I want to do so I went to a meeting and immediately just knew like yes this is a community I want to be a part of you know this is where I need to be and now some other friends are also interested in it so it's just kind of like the co-op is falling in my lap perfect you know better than I could have planned at the right time you know and I'm ready for it now and it's just all you know although I'll be still be challenged I'll still grow and I'll still be learning a lot you know it's something that I'm looking forward to I'm excited to tackle the challenge as opposed to oh my god how am I going to do this like I don't know if I want to do this the way it was you know last year so um, just you know letting Yahweh letting him do it in his strength um, and then Yeshua goes on to make the point about standing alone more explicitly later in Luke 6 he says blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. <laughs> for so their fathers did to the prophets. Yay! Um, I just thought that was really funny because <laughs> I haven't read that in a while. But um, the cool thing about that is, like, if you really have him, people can do that, and it's not going to hurt that bad. You know, it sounds horrible, but if you really have him, it doesn't matter. Um, and the reason why you need to be like that, this is a continuous process for our growth um, you know you're always going to need to get to another level so you're going to need to pull out from the crowd and you know allow Yahweh to, to minister you and grow you up further um, and in Luke 6 39 we have um, can a blind man lead a blind man will they not both fall into a pit a disciple is not above his teacher but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye but do, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? So if you're concerned about you know, your friend's opinions, um, the way the world sees things, you know, you're going to be just as blind as the next guy. You can't really help them. And you, know, you, you need to be separated to do it and you want to do it because um, you know it makes the point after that you hypocrite first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck to take out the speck that is in your brother's eye so the speck needs to come out you know somebody's got to get it out but if you're going to do it you know you need to be able to separate and then come back um, to stand alone with Yahweh um, and I'm actually doing a fasting criticism with Shelley Goldberg from this church um, we we wanted to fast for a financial breakthrough in particular and so one of the things we agreed to fast was criticism all forms of criticism of ourselves and others even mental and so after the first day of trying to do this I was texting her like 
Maybe we should have decided to fast air. I think that would have been easier because, <laughs> like, it, I just didn't realize, you know, I, I mean, I pursue excellence all the time. I have a certain standard of excellence. I see things a certain way, and, you know, when, when other people don't see it that way, it's just natural for me to, to, you know, be like, well, that's not how it should be, you know. So I just realized how much I was doing this. Um, and, then, and then I also, you know, looking at Yeshua, well, he criticized, he called people hypocrites, so, you know, maybe we shouldn't be a fasting criticism. <laughs> but um, I got a revelation out of that. Again, like, you know, pushback can, can really give you the revelation as long as you don't say no. You know, you say, okay, I don't get this, I'll do it, but, but you still pursue, pursue the revelation. So um, what he was showing me that, is that, you know, there's a difference between criticizing someone because you don't like the way they do things, you know, that's not the way you would do it, um, it's not your taste or whatever, versus you see a barrier to this person living an abundant life and, and you need to remove it, you know. It's going after something that's really hindering them in love as opposed to, you know, uh, I think you should do it this way kind of thing. Um, so I was blessed by that. Um, and just a little aside, it's, uh, <laughs> I was um, listening to, we, we bought this uh, CD of the Bible um, where these different actors are reading, you know, reading the parts. And uh, it was basically for when we're traveling, when we can't read, we can still hear, hear the word. And, you know, Pastor Dan is, uh, has worked a lot with us on our image of Yeshua and um, really seeing him as he is and seeing that love is not always nice, you know, and uh, he's not lacking in testosterone at all, you know, like Yeshua is a man's man. And so Pastor Dan's really good at helping us to see that in the word. Um, and on this CD, we have uh, Jim Caviezel as Yeshua. And it's hilarious because he's like, <laughs> when he's saying hypocrites, he's like, hypocrites. <laughs> so first remove the, the speck that is in your own eye before you try to take the log out of or whatever the, wor the word is. But, you know, he's like all soft and, you know, oh, you silly person. And I just crack up every time I hear it, like to the point where I can't, <laughs> I can't even listen to it anymore. <laughs> but it's important to have the right image of Yeshua, um, to really see him as he is. Okay, and so another point, I think this is my last main point, is that... People are going to question you as you step out, as you do this. Um, you know, the world is crying out for the sons of Elohim to manifest. So there's, you know, not a lot of people doing this, haven't been doing this for some time. And so some people are just going to say, you know, they're going to criticize you and say, you don't know what you're doing, you're crazy. But then you're going to have other people who actually have the right motives. Like, are you for real? How do you have this power? I want to know, you know, how do you do this? Um, and so Yeshua gives us the response. Um, when John the Baptist questioned him um, in Luke 7:22, he says, "Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight." And all this is literal and figurative. You know, we can apply it today. The blind receive their sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. So, you know, your answer is, yeah, I'm for real. I can do this. And you can too. Yeshua is in me. You know, he's no respecter of persons. Anybody can do this. You just have to want to. You just have to have the guts to do it. So we are the real deal. And, you know, we're, um, we are going to do these things. We're not going to just abandon people. You know, we can't just do it, do it one day and then not do it for another six years, you know. We have to be consistent because people need us to do it. Um, and then this one last parable I'm going to read, starting in verse 41. Um, a certain money lender, money lender had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debt of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, the one, I suppose, for whom he canceled the larger debt. And he said to him, You have judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, 
Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But he who is forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. So, you know, you not only want to look for love to be manifest in yourself, but you also want to look for it in others, um, to fellowship with it and to draw it out. And again, going back to the funeral example, you know, it's not that we were needing these people's approval, that we, you know, needed closure, whatever. It's that we wanted, we were really looking for to fellowship with like precious faith, to really have something exciting happen, you know, to connect love, our love with their love. Um, so again, love only comes from one source. He's a person, and his name is Yahweh, Yeshua. Um, that one source is everywhere at all times, and he's ready for you to recognize him and give him permission to manifest, manifest himself in the way he chooses in you and in others who are with you. So, um, you know, you're always looking for love in you and in others. And I um, hope that makes sense. Hope you got something out of that. It's already 9 o'clock. <laughs> okay. Are you doing offering? Okay. Hallelujah. Let's give Yahweh another hand clap. That, that word. Beautiful word. Hallelujah. So we are going to do the offering now. It was fun. It was funny as I was as I was listening. I like that. There you go. Again. Yes. When the offering comes out, that's good. I like that energy. <clears throat> Before we started praise and worship, I had the scripture on my mind, my heart. Uh, you know, to have a peace that surpasses understanding. And just a week ago, uh, my wife was on the phone and we were praying with a friend and while she was praying for her friend I was hearing that scripture as well and today listening to Rachel I started hearing it again and at that moment it's, it, it's like the Holy Spirit is making it make more and more sense and now we can apply it to the offering but I was seeing peace and understanding almost like in this race to get to me <laughs> and <laughs> They're both trying to get there, and I was seeing peace basically won. Peace beat understanding to get to me. And then, so at the moment when we get to receive a, a, a word, we get to receive from the Holy Spirit, there's this peace that we get to either receive it in spite of our, of, of our lacking understanding or not. You know, but the peace ultimately, it surpassed understanding. We see that a lot of times it's in like, it's a bigger peace. It's bigger than your understanding. But I was seeing it as like a proximity thing. Peace got there first. And then you get to decide whether you want to just take that peace and receive it without having to make sense of it. And then by doing that, you, you make room for the understanding to come into your heart and really take root so then you have that thing to give which is exactly what what Rachel was talking about you know when you're looking for love you look you understand where you're looking for it when you can just receive the peace of knowing oh he's real and and he's bigger and 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 stronger and faster and smarter and he's just he's just everything and with our offering we really get to kind of there's it happens all at the same time you have this thing you have a value. You have your money. You work hard for it. And you trust that seed time and harvest exist forever. You know that he's going to make a, he's going to give to you. If you, you know, you know that if you sow sparingly, you're going to reap also sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. So you have these scriptures that are in your mind around the offering and around the tithe. And those scriptures bring a peace, but a lot of the times it's a real quick transition to where that money hits the bucket or the envelope or whatever it is, and you're like, 
Uh oh, I don't understand what's happening right now. <laughs> I'm missing the money, and then they, and you're missing that thing, or it happens before you even put the money in there, and your understanding limits your giving, you know, because you don't let the peace make you give abundantly in a way that ultimately brings a bigger understanding, not only of why you're giving, but a bigger understanding of how to get more to give. And so that's the way that he a lot of time will facilitate your return is simply getting in that place where you receive the peace that lets you give more, you know. And so that, that's why he's saying, I want you to sow bountifully because I want you to sow in this way that is like that go all, that is really like you're sowing. So that your sowing is, is proof that you don't understand. <laughs> like you ever give something that's so much. And maybe tell a friend who's not saved, who's not a believer, or something. You're like, man, I'm feeling a little. Or somehow, you probably don't tell your friends. Hey, guess what I gave at church? But you know, sometimes it gets out. It has with me. <laughs> I was talking to a friend, and he might ask me, "Oh yeah, have you ever? What's the most you ever gave?" And I'm like, oh, "I gave this one time." And what? Are you crazy? Like, what are you? Because well, he doesn't understand it at all. You know, but you, you, you receive this peace. And you don't let anything take it away. You don't let your missing understanding or somebody else's lacking understanding prevent you from giving fully. And it was just like Holy Spirit was connecting dots while I was listening to Rachel say, you look for that love. When, you, when you're looking for love in the right place, there's this peace that kind of it takes you through everything. You know, you take what you, whatever comes at you and you just keep going towards that love because that's, that's what you're doing. You know? So... That was a long-winded way to save. Prepare your offerings and <laughs> make your checks payable to Faith Exchange. If you're online, click on Donate. Um, sow a seed. Receive the peace of knowing what you're pursuing is going to bear fruit in your life. Amen. 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 It's really, really cool stuff. All right, one more thing, real quick. Let's serve the people. So everybody, everybody's ready. We'll, we'll, we'll uh, breathe life into two birds with one breath. Like that. No music, Joe. <laughs> you know, I don't like killing the birds with, the two, with one stone. So we breathe the life with one breath. So, but along that same idea, I was having this talk with my wife, and it really blessed me. I was having this imagery about, re, you've heard, resist, resist the enemy. And very similar to what Rachel was talking about. You know, there's only looking for love in one right place. There's one place to go look for love. And the enemy wants to pull you down. And your father is the most high. So we're always trying to go up. And a lot of the time, you know, Pastor Anna saw this before, like if you're trying to break a bad habit, you don't, if you, if you don't want to eat the cake, you don't want to eat the chocolate cake. You don't walk around all day saying, don't eat chocolate cake, don't eat chocolate cake, don't eat chocolate cake, don't eat chocolate cake. Because you're saying chocolate cake, chocolate cake, chocolate cake, chocolate cake all the time. You're reinforcing. So as soon as you see a piece of chocolate, you don't eat the chocolate, don't eat the chocolate, and you ate the chocolate cake. So the idea of resisting, you know, by going up, if you're always pursuing love in the right way, then you're resisting anything that pulls you down. That's how you resist your enemy is by going towards love all the, all, all the time. And again, we get to do that with our offering as well. Uh, it's just such a powerful message. All right, I'm going to stop. I'm going to let the rest of the dots connect in me. And I'm not going to share all of it. Hallelujah. Has everybody served? Everybody been, been served with a bucket? <laughs> don't you not. Don't nod at me like that. Don't. <laughs> I can only be me. I can only be me. <laughs> Hallelujah. You want to pray? You want to pray? You want to pray? Hallelujah. Yahweh, we just thank you for this offering right now. Reach your hand out towards this. We present this to you, Yeshua. You are the high priest. You are the most high. And right now, we just reach out towards you. We are extending. We are stretching ourselves. We are allowing everything that won't go up to fall right down off of us. As we pursue you, we just thank you so much. We make room for your love. 
we make room for you. We just pursue you above all things. I call this the best everyone could do. This offering is, is anointed. I thank you that the tithers live under an open heaven, that the devourer is rebuked on their behalf. I thank you that there is a hundredfold return. We're grateful for the 30 and 60 fold as well But I thank you for the 100 fold return For everyone in here this evening I thank you that this seed will produce I thank you that your word does not return void And I thank you that people Had your word on this seed As they sowed it So it will return full Full overflowing I call everyone in here blessed by the word tonight I call Rachel blessed For having the ears to hear that word And deliver it to us And we just give this to you right now faithfully serving you in Yeshua's name in Jesus name we pray amen alright you are dismissed hug two or three people on your way out